Good morning and afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the National Housing Resource Center's uh, Leaders in Housing Counseling webinar. Today's topic is it's not too late to learn how ARPA fiscal recovery funds affect your agency. My name is Ebony, Administrative Manager here at NHRC, and I will be your navigator for today. There are a couple of housekeeping items that we wanna go over before we get started for the day. Uh, the first is that a copy of today's presentation will be added to the chat box of this webinar periodically throughout the presentation. Um, also, if, uh, oh, also this webinar is being recorded, it will be sent out via email along with a copy of the presentation and any other uh, items that you need to know. Um, if you need to access closed captioning, it has been enabled for this presentation. Just click the tra live, transcript, live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. It says live transcript CC, um, and you'll be able to see. Uh, oh, also, there will be a Q&A session at the end of this presentation after our present presenters are done we will have a session for Q&A. If you have any questions that you wanna ask, you can put it in the Q&A box, which is located also at the bottom of your screen and we'll be sure to ask the question for you at the end of the presentations. Um, oh, also, if you, <laughs> if you don't mind, in the comments section, if you have any comments in general, you can add them to the uh, chat box. But we will also love for you guys to add to the chat box what organization you're representing and what city and state you're in. We would love to see who we have watching our webinar today. And with that, I'm going to turn everything over to Bruce Dor Palin, who will be able to take us in from here. Excellent. Thanks, Ebony, and welcome to our call. We. Uh, uh, well, we have a lot of work to do, so we're just going to kind of dump, jump in pretty quickly. Just to review the plan here is we're going to do a um, coverage of the legislative updates we've got coming up on our um, uh, the work that we're doing in, in Congress and a little bit with the administration. So I want to make sure everybody's on top of what's happening with appropriations and with budget reconciliation and nominations. Um, and um, I'll do a couple quick um, check-ins with you about things we're hearing about and hopefully encourage you to let us know if there are challenges out there around predatory activities, around um, uh, how for forbearance is working and um, challenges with servicers. Certainly always interested in, in all kinds of things that can feed into the issues uh, that we're working on. Um, and Chrissy's gonna give us a quick update on the housing counseling career path um, and our jobs board. Just make sure, remind everybody about the opportunity there uh, to really help expand the housing counseling field. We're gonna spend most of the call on ARPA and um, the fact that the money is arriving uh, has been there, but um, a number of cities and localities have not actually um, uh, finalize their plans. This is a big opportunity with uh, both uh, uh, both for funding and collaboration. It's a really an opportunity to do some bigger ambitious things. Um, and we're glad to have Rob Finn on from the Center for Community Progress um, to talk about the mechanics of how it works and, and what can be funded and a special emphasis on um, uh, on what kind of appropriate things are under housing counseling, but also think about this as something you might do this in conjunction with others so that um, it's, a, it's a bigger, broader program. Um, and then uh, we're gonna have Kate Carden um, uh, back again from CHN Housing Partners. Um, and this time talking about what the conversations they're having around this. Um, and then we'll have a very short summary from um, the Anne Arundel Affordable Housing Coalition they um, um, they won't be able to join us, but I'll just walk through a little bit of what how their conversations have started, just to give you a flavor of what the opportunity is. Um, but every everyone every local plan will be a local plan, and um, uh, hopefully you'll have the tools to move forward on it. We'll have Q and A, so please put the uh, Q and A in the question box so that um, uh, as we go along, so we can jump in and and and. Uh, uh, 
uh, make sure we capture whatever your questions are. Um, and then we'll do a quick reminder about joining NHRC and, and really thank you for the groups that actually renewed on their own without us prompting um, for uh, uh, January and February already. So thanks a big, a big thanks for that. And if you haven't joined or if you haven't renewed, uh, we'll give you a quick reminder at the end of the call. Um, so with that, let, let's get started. So Christy, give us the legislative updates. What's happening in Congress? Hello, everyone. It's Christy Villalobos Hausler from the NHRC. Um, first, in terms of uh, the budget reconciliation update, I want to thank you all for signing on to our sign on letter this month. We sent it out February 1st to urge Democrats in the House and Senate to include strong housing investments in the budget reconciliation bill or bills. Um, our letter included the support of over 130 groups like the National Association of Realtors, MBA, the National. National Association of Home Builders, and of course, um, all of you. So thank you again for all your support. Um, the president's priorities do not include housing. So we've been meeting with House and Senate um, appropriators to ensure that housing counseling is considered in final negotiations. We've been urging Democrats to talk to Republican leadership about including housing investments, and we've been emphasizing the first generation down payment assistance. Next on appropriations for FY 2022, the House proposed $100 million in funding for housing counseling. Senate proposed $57.5 million, so we've been advocating for uh, to both chamber, to both chambers for $100 million in housing counseling funding. We're currently sending out a Dear Colleague letter through Senator Menendez's office. Dear colleague letters are sent out to legislative offices to show that there is broad support for these specific provisions, in this case for housing counseling funding. His office is collecting signatures from various Senate offices. Um, and also earlier in the year, Senator Menendez sent out our dear colleague letter, and he's leading the charge on this letter as well. Additionally, for FY 2022, we met with Senator Joe Manchin's office recently with several housing groups from West Virginia and the Catholic Charities as well. And it went really well. The Senator is open to including housing investments in the budget. He is concerned about the rural versus urban divide in the housing funding. So we're working on generating a report for him with the data that includes the funding details for rural versus urban communities in West Virginia. Additionally, last week, the House passed a bill to extend continuing resolution funding until March 11th. This prevented the government shutdown from happening while negotiations over the long-term budget are ongoing. Some Republicans are holding the spending bill hostage while pushing for cuts to the program by threatening a full year CR unless they get a roll call vote on an amendment to prohibit using funds to enforce federal COVID vaccine mandates. Though this is only a few Republicans, they are slowing down the process. A full year CR would be damaging because it would cut spending for programs back down to Trump level funding and they also wouldn't cover inflationary costs. So housing programs need increases to keep up with inflation uh, every year, and Congress needs to provide a little more. So the good news is that we met with um, a few Republican staffers that seemed confident that there would be a top line number. Senate will go on recess next week, and um, hopefully we'll hear more about that afterwards. And lastly, we'll be sending out the FY 2023 sign on letter. We would really appreciate your support. So if you could sign off on it, that would be wonderful. It would show ample support across various districts to our, our congressional members. Once the time comes, I will also email you to ask you to um, set up programmatic request letters with your congressional members. This would prioritize funding for housing counseling in FY 2023. And um, I'll also mention the jobs board um, link in the chat if you're interested. Thank you so much. There we go. Thanks so much, Christy. Um, a lot of work going on. So if you're talking to House or Senate offices, please uh, be sure to uh, um, ask for in FY2022, $400 million for housing counseling. And at this point, they really need to talk to appropriations leadership. Uh, that's really being all being decided by leadership in the process. And um, but 
as Christy mentioned, the programmatic request letters are letters sent by rank and file um, uh, House and Senate members to approach telling them what their priorities are. And so uh, asking that uh, for 23, that $100 million for housing counseling be included in their program of request letter. This actually works best if it's coming from somebody locally. We will make a point of asking um, um, a number of offices on our own, but uh, as you probably know, we're based in Philadelphia, and um, uh, so the local request makes a big difference. Uh, and Christy will put out a, a there'll, there'll be a timing moment um, where these really need to start moving. Christy will put out a note for that. So keep an eye out for that and for the um, our annual sign on letter, good tradition here. You have to get all 50 states covered there. So, speaking to you in um, South Dakota and Kansas, um, places that we have a little harder time getting signatures on. So, um, here's sort of on updates. I wanted to talk a little bit with you all about um, uh, what you're seeing in the field. And um, we're very interested if there are predatory practices. Um, you know, the foreclosure crisis was notorious for those. We seem to be seeing a little bit less of it this time around. So that's good news. Um, uh, we just recently got reports from groups in Colorado that um, there were law firms that were charging $500 for groups to make um, um, housing assistance funds applications or applications for um, uh, uh, loan modification. Um, again, those are all things that should be free and um, uh, can go through us. So if you've got documentation of that happening, um, we would love to alert people in the field about it. Um, also heard from uh, groups that, uh, from lawyers in New York uh, State um, about uh, zombie second liens. So you probably remember during um, the foreclosure crisis, there were a lot of 2080 loans, and these were 20% down payment um, that were actually a loan and 80% for a, um, a 30 year mortgage. And those doubled up loans um, or way of, of um, getting around the, um, if you have a small down payment, having to pay private mortgage insurance. And um, some of them were quite aggressively priced and unrealistically priced. And when they were underwater, basically either got charged off or ignored by the lender. Well, there's some law firms that have made a business out of buying the, that paper up and um, then and now coming back 10 and 15 years later and saying, um, you know, you're due on this. And um, this is often people don't always know that they have them, um, certainly have forgotten about them and not gotten notice in years about them. And suddenly they're trying to revive them. Um, uh, there's some laws in New York which uh, prevent this particular activity um, because uh, there's a statute of limitations. Um, but we want to find out if it's happening. Um, anywhere else and, um, and hopefully we can plug you into uh, where there are um, uh, opportunities that uh, with lawyers that might be able to address this. Um, one of the things they saw in New York is that it's very highly correlated with communities of color and um, that these are uh, on properties where values have gone up dramatically since the foreclosure crisis. And so it makes it a, um, a fertile field for people who are trying to strip out equity and, and capture uh, funding. Um, any kind of activity like that, we're very interested in and want to elevate this. Um, we have a meeting coming up with the CFPB, um, hopefully in the next month, uh, where we'll raise a number of the kinds of things that we're seeing as problems. This could be one of those things on those lists. Um, another one would be about servicers who are um, uh, not doing the right thing or um, um, not um, handling the transition from forbearance to um, uh, to uh, um, uh, well, getting to a working affordable mortgage payment um, uh, properly, um, all those kinds of things, especially if you have examples and, and we can find out who the servicer was. Those will be very useful in those meetings. Um, and we will, uh, um, so please tell us if you're seeing problems around that part of the field as well. Um, uh, the, the, uh, 
the CFPB is very interested in trying to move forward on, on this, these, those specific issues. Um, and we'll have a housing counseling specific meeting on that. Uh, we'll also bring up about the lender fee for service and try to get that to be a re resolution. Um, the, as some of you have been following this, uh, the no action letter, while it seemed like a good solution at the time, uh, we've only had two lenders actually adopt it and it seems to have stalled. Um, and it's, it's inordinately difficult to um, do and we think there's an easier solution in just identifying housing counseling as a service in the same way as you might get a home inspection or something else. Um, and, and so that's another thing we'll be working on with the CFPB. So let us know if you've got any examples of things that are problems out there in the field. And the last thing was on um, the housing counseling career path and our jobs uh, board. Um, Christy, did you have more you wanted to say about that or should I just jump in on that? Yes, you can jump in. Okay, so um, uh, as people have been following, um, uh, we put up our jobs board on in December, um, and uh, we've now had, I think, um, over 60 jobs posted. Um, there seems to be a pretty good turnaround, um, but you know, it's just, a, I think, a drop in the bucket of the number of jobs that are available um, in our field. This is free for HUD approved housing counseling agencies. So one, if you're advertising for jobs, please put it on the list. Um, and if you are, if you know people who are looking and want to get into the field, uh, they're welcome to look for the positions that are available there. Um, at the same time, um, we've been working with Housing Action Illinois. Um, David Young did a good presentation last um, a couple of months ago on, on this work. They're training, they've, they've closed out the first training cycle, had 38 people in the training. Um, a few of them have already passed the certification test. And this is just a training to get people certified, not a full training of housing counseling. And the idea is that then they can enter the jobs market or if there are um, working with an agency now, um, that they might be able to um, upgrade their role to be a housing certified housing counselor. This was um, our first run at this. Um, looks like this, the early, early reviews are very strong um, and uh, they're scheduling more of these to, do, to come. And again, this is all part of our campaign to build up the housing counseling task force, uh, the workforce to uh, make sure we have enough housing counseling um, staffers to meet the demand. So with that note, let's go to um, transition over to the, the main topic at hand today, and that's the ARPA fund uh, funds, the fiscal recovery funds, um, and how they affect their agencies. So we're really pleased to have Rob Finn here to talk to us from the um, uh, who's really become quite an expert on this. He's with the Center for Community Progress and um, is, uh, um, uh, you'll see, will give us a good amount of detail about how this actually works. So Rob. Thank you, Bruce. <clears throat> Thanks everyone at NHRC. Um, really appreciate all the important work your community does. So thanks everyone for listening. Um, I'm, uh, I am a, a recovering tenant advocate and legal services attorney. So um, the, the work that you do is really important and close to my heart. Uh, the work I do at the Center for Community Progress is primarily uh, involving communities with uh, large scale vacancy and abandonment. Our organization was created in the aftermath of the mortgage crisis uh, a little over a decade ago. And uh, so most of the work that we do is addressing um, vacant and abandoned properties that have a negative impact on markets, negative impact on neighbors and neighborhoods. And so the importance of the work you do in keeping people stably housed um, to prevent properties from sliding into foreclosure, whether through mortgage or property tax, is uh, vital to the work that we do as well. Here's what I'm not going to talk about with respect to the American Rescue Plan Act. I'm not going to talk about the Homeowner Assistance Fund. I'm not going to talk about the Emergency Rental Assistance Program. And I'm not going to talk about the Capital Projects Fund. I say that at the outset because it's important to know that the American Rescue Plan Act, which passed in March of last year, uh, has a lot of important, uh, valuable programs funded at very high levels to provide all kinds of levels of support. What I am going to talk about is the state and local fiscal recovery fund. You can move to the next slide. 
Um, so the state and local fiscal recovery fund is a $350 billion pool of funds distributed at every level of government in the country and its territories. So every municipality, large and small, every county and every state gets its own allocation of this $350 billion total. There's also a $10 billion add-on for specific infrastructure uses, but the, those uses are also eligible uses for the full $350 billion pool as well. So some people, you might see some coverage saying it's $360 billion. Uh, generally speaking, for the L, for the broad category of uses that I'll be talking about, it's a $350 billion pool. Um, the There is a separate process for uh, entitlement communities, CDBG entitlement communities, uh, often referred to as metropolitan cities of populations of 50,000 and over. Uh, since they already uh, receive uh, direct allocations, their process for obtaining these funds is a little bit different than non-entitlement units of government, uh, which are units of government at the local level below uh, 50,000 population threshold. So anywhere you see in this deck, NEU abbreviated, that's for those smaller communities that don't typically receive entitlement funding. Um, and again, it is the first time the federal government has provided direct flexible relief to all 19,000 and counting municipalities. Next slide. So our organization, uh, given the work that we do, has been very involved in uh, ARPA advocacy uh, around the state and local fiscal recovery funds. Uh, we have a bunch of resources on our website. This deck will be shared with you. There are a lot of hyperlinks embedded in this deck, so, um, so I wanted to try and create as many resources as possible. We developed using the uh, spreadsheets that Treasury provided for the monetary allocations to different la layers of government. We created a GIS map, uh, which I've got a screenshot here. If you toggle through the, the three pages in Genesee County, Michigan, you can see how much money is coming to Flint, how much money is coming to the county, and how much money is coming to the state. Um, uh, but again, looking just at Genesee County, uh, almost $80 million uh, was allocated for Genesee County, Michigan, which is a huge amount of money. Um, we've also done a lot of work around sharing uh, our perspectives on Treasury's interim final rule, which uh, was released in the spring of last year on an emergency basis. So the rule went into effect immediately. Um, we also led a public uh, comment campaign advocating amongst our community that focuses on vacancy and abandonment for specific expansions in Treasury's final rule around how funds can be used for things like land banking, demolition, uh, rehabilitation, inspection, vacant property, uh, and vacant lot maintenance. Um, we're really uh, thrilled that Treasury actually took us up on our public comments and that that campaign was a success. So there's a number of resources uh, on our website uh, that focus on the state and local fiscal recovery funds. Next slide. So this is a program that is, is being administered by the Treasury Department. Uh, there are a number of different uh, pieces of guidance that have been released by Treasury. The most important two are the final rule, which was released in January of this year. The interim final rule, which the final rule, uh, a lot of the final rule references uh, the interim final rule, so that's kind of important to read them in concert with each other as opposed to solely looking at the final rule, but um, a lot of questions about the interim final rule were answered in the final rule and a lot of things were expanded or clarified. So uh, a lot of folks were uh, confused about certain areas, uh, submitted public comments and Treasury did its best to try and clarify or expand on and in some cases change some of what was laid out in the interim final rule. There's also uh, some important documents around uh, guidance to states about how to distribute the funds to the NEU uh, uh, units of government. Uh, Treasury was directly delivering these funds to the states, the counties, and uh, to the entitlement uh, metropolitan cities, and was delivering a pool of funds to states to then administer directly to their uh, smaller communities. Uh, 
There's also uh, a FAQ documents on Treasury's website, uh, that landing page, which Treasury has been at various points in time updating and trying to be responsive to uh, questions that have come along both while it was in the interim final rule stage, and we're hoping that they will continue to be responsive to questions uh, about the final rule. There's also important documents there uh, around compliance uh, and reporting, uh, and that there are different levels of compliance and, uh, and reporting, depending on the size of the award and the uh, type of unit of government you are. So um, important to know that funds must be obligated by the end of 2024, but may continue to be spent until the end of 2026. Next slide. So broadly, uh, I won't spend too much time on this because I'm going to get to the housing counseling stuff, but broadly, the, uh, the uh, ARPA state and local fiscal recovery funds are designed to support public health expenditures, address negative economic impacts caused or made worse by the public health emergency, that's important, to replace lost public sector revenue, to provide premium pay for essential workers, and to provide investments in water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure. I want to emphasize for folks that this is a very flexible program, but communities will be designing their own spending plans. So any uses I talk about are possible uses they are not necessarily going to come to your communities or your states or your counties unless you are advocating for them. So the Treasury has offered guidance. Treasury is not requiring any pre-clearance. So unlike some of the other programs under ARPA, like the uh, HAF program, uh, you, cities and counties and states don't need to get the thumbs up from Treasury to spend the money uh, based on a proposal. Treasury is essentially saying, go forth and comply and write back to us at the various compliance and oversight check-ins, but we're not gonna be reviewing plans and giving you a, a, a thumbs up or a thumbs down in advance. As a lot of folks know, that's a little scary to some local and county leaders uh, and they don't wanna spend funds and get funds clawed back because Treasury said, no, you couldn't do that. So be careful what you wish for when you get flexible federal dollars and different communities are going to have different experiences based on the courage and imagination of their political leaders and the lawyers that interpret these rules for them. Next slide. So the general eligibility formula specifically for negative economic impacts are that uh, they need to have resulted from or been exacerbated by the COVID-19 public health emergency. And any specifically enumerated use in the rules um, is typically a non, uh, uh, represented as a non-exhaustive list, which means that uh, Treasury is trying to provide examples of things that are absolutely going to be approved, but they're trying to emphasize that we're not, we don't want to uh, presume to know every use that your community might be able to, to develop to address economic impacts that are uh, uh, impacting your communities. So uh, there is some flexibility even for uses that are not exclusively or specifically uh, enumerated. So the general rule of thumb is that communities have to identify the economic harm that resulted from or was made worse by COVID-19, has to explain why and how the use of ARPA funds responds to or addresses this harm, and then has to demonstrate that the intervention that is being funded by these dollars is related and reasonably proportional to that harm. Um, but again, in the rules, Treasury has said that they, they want state, local, and tribal governments to have broad latitude to choose whether and how to use these funds. Next slide. So the area that I think is gonna be most relevant to the housing counseling community is going to uh, be specific uses related to negative economic impacts uh, in a section of the rules that focuses on assistance to households. So um, there are specifically enumerated uses which include food assistance, rent, mortgage, or utility assistance, explicitly includes housing counseling and legal aid to prevent eviction or homelessness, cash assistance programs, emergency assistance for burials, home repairs, weatherization, or other needs, 
internet access or digital literacy assistance, and job training. Next slide. So there are, uh, and when one searches the Federal Register PDF, which is uh, found on the Treasury landing page, it's linked in this uh, deck that you'll receive. There, uh, if you do a word search for counsel or counseling, you will find what I'm about to show you, which is the very explicit mentions of housing counseling in the final rule. Uh, these are uh, verbatim quotes. I've taken the liberty to do some bolding. Uh, but essentially, uh, Treasury is, in its final rule has made clear that housing counseling, fair housing counseling, and case management related to housing stability and outreach to households at risk of eviction and other uses listed here, as well as legal aid and legal services or attorney's fees related to eviction proceedings or maintaining housing stability are all eligible uses under this program. Next slide. Additionally, uh, so on the one hand, yay, these dollars can be used to fund housing counseling programs. But what you're likely more concerned about is, OK, but what dollars can be used to pull the levers that we typically get involved in as house, housing counselors? What are the uses we can help our clients uh, take advantage of? And so the Treasury goes into a little more detail in the final rule than they did in the previous rules to uh, explain clearly that uh, rent, rent arrears, utility costs or arrears, uh, reasonably accrued late fees, mortgage payment assistance, uh, assistance to homeowners to reinstate a mortgage, to pay other housing related costs related to forbearance, delinquency or default, principal reduction, facilitating interest rate reductions, counseling to prevent foreclosure or displacement, relocation expenses. One thing they did clarify in the final rule is that delinquent property taxes are uh, also eligible under these sort of housing related assistance costs. Um, it wasn't clear and there are some prohibitions against generally using, um, it, using these funds to reduce taxes. So we're very happy to hear um, that delinquent property taxes to prevent Tax foreclosure on homes is also permissible and always has been under this program. Uh, next slide. Um, additionally, uh, there's another section that makes explicit reference to residential counseling, housing navigation assistance to facilitate moves to neighborhoods of opportunity, um, and uh, that uh, these uh, types of counseling programs are also eligible, and these types of uh, interventions are also eligible to receive funding through this program. Next slide. So um, important in, uh, additions to uh, the program made clear by the final rule, the interim final rule made reference to low and moderate income without actually giving any specific bans uh, of, uh, with respect to area median income or federal poverty guidelines. So they've clarified in the final rule that any household that is uh, at or below 40% of AMI or 185% of the federal poverty guidelines uh, is deemed low income. And any household at or below 65% of AMI or 300% of federal poverty guidelines is deemed moderate income. These distinctions become important when uh, talking about communities that were quote unquote impacted by the pandemic versus quote, uh, communities that were quote unquote disproportionately impacted uh, by the pandemic. There's also a spreadsheet that helps recipients determine what those thresholds are in their local communities and states. Next slide. So uh, it's a little difficult to discern um, and communities are being pretty cautious from what I've seen thus far, but in the interim final rules, there's a whole host of explicitly eligible uses specific to disproportionately impacted communities, which under the interim rule, Treasury used low income qualified census tracts as a sort of proxy for, um, and also deemed uh, determined that any tribal governments are, 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 uh, and people living in them would automatically be deemed disproportionately impacted. 
uh, such that uh, even more sort of broad uses like uh, violence interventions pr uh, programs and the development uh, of new affordable housing, for example, could be done in qualified census tracts and as a presumptively eligible use. Treasury has um, clarified and expanded that a bit. Uh, it has, um, uh, so you need not just look at your qualified census tract map to see where these disproportionately impacted communities are. Treasury gives some guidance about how communities can essentially make the case for why in their community we're seeing this specific type of population or this specific geography has been disproportionately impacted. Um, additionally, Treasury has added that any residents in U.S. territories um, or programs uh, administered by U.S. territories may be presumptively deemed disproportionately impacted. Next slide. So I started this conversation talking about the fact that this is not, uh, these, these dollars are not automatically coming to you not automatically coming to your clients. There are so many uses under the state and local fiscal recovery fund program that uh, stakeholders are really having to fight for space in their local allocations and at the tables uh, where policymakers are deciding how these funds are gonna be spent and what the highest needs are for their communities. There are some communities that don't have the luxury of creating new programs because they are simply using almost or all of their allocations to make up for lost revenue. So the, the results will vary greatly. Um, some communities are doing, uh, already starting to do innovative things. Uh, I know of a number of communities that are creating home repair programs for low-income homeowners uh, to try and uh, provide more stable, supportive uh, programs to keep people stably housed to make their uh, housing healthier and stronger. Um, but these allocations are going to your counties, your cities, and your states. So there's a number of layers of advocacy that can or should be done. Also important to know for a number of uh, recipients uh, that they've only received half the money that was allocated to them so far. The second half should be sent sometime this summer, the first allocations went out, uh, I think in June or July. And then the second half of those allocations should be coming uh, 12 months after that first allocation. Next slide. Also, if you'd like to hear me talk about this more and would like to hear from a local leader at the uh, land bank in the greater Syracuse area of New York, uh, explain what process they've undertaken to engage leaders around how to use these dollars in ways that they can provide uh, support to their communities, as well as a uh, local leader in Decatur, Illinois, who has designed one of those home repair programs and really put a lot of thinking into it. Um, we'll be doing a webinar about this uh, hosted by our uh, Cornerstone webinar uh, series in uh, on March 10th. And um, last slide, I think, is just contact information for me. Thanks. Well, nice. Thank you very much, Rob. That was terrific. Um, we uh, um, and this will be a recording um, that we'll post up on the web webinar on the on our website, and uh, you can always get it in our video library as well. Um, the uh, our next presenter is Kate Carden, Director of Financial Mobility at um, CHN Housing Partners. Um, we had Kate um, her, um, a little while ago on the good work they're doing on, on tenant protections and eviction intervention. Um, and this time it's uh, what their conversations look like on ARP. And I do have to do a shout out. This is such a great photograph uh, that you've got as your lead photograph. Just love it. So Kate, welcome and glad to have you. Thank you. Thanks Bruce and, and thanks for having me. Um, we, we always appreciate um, being connected to this group um, and we can start at the next slide. Um, just to give some context about who CHN um, Housing Partners is, um, which has kind of guided how we've been advocating around ARPA. Um, we were initially founded 40 years ago by six local CDCs. There was a lack of affordable housing um, in the city of Cleveland. And so a group of CDCs came together to form CHN so we could 
um, use the power of everyone's voice to enact some change. Um, we focus on the power of a permanent address. Um, we leverage affordable and stable housing um, to change lives and improve communities. Uh, we partner with sister nonprofits, government entities, financial institutions, um, and other like-minded institutions that also seek to improve housing stability. Um, we are headquartered in Cleveland, um, but we have um, a pretty robust operation in Detroit, Michigan now, and we're also working um, on some light tech um, projects in both Pittsburgh and Western New York. Um, we serve um, around 50,000 uh, households annually. Uh, we own and manage around 2,200 units throughout the city of Cleveland. Um, and to date, through our flagship lease purchase program, we've helped over 1,400 families um, become successful homeowners um, through our LIHTC affordable housing program. Next slide, please. Um, so what we do is provide integrated housing solutions to achieve substantial and meaningful outcomes for residents. Every one of these boxes this past year has received additional resources because of um, funding that has become available through um, CARES Act and other related funds. So we've seen great increases in funding available for affordable housing and real estate development, um, home lending, particularly with down payment assistance and first time home buyer programs, um, utility assistance, our counseling and education programs have received um, great um, amount of funding, some areas we weren't expecting, which I'll, I'll mention in a little while, energy conservation and weatherization, as well as community building and engagement. Next slide, please. We are a HUD approved housing counseling agency. Um, and again, each of these areas have received resources um, throughout the pandemic and we're hoping um, through ARPA in, in the coming uh, months and years. Um, so we provide all of these um, HUD services, as well as managing a pretty robust um, BIDA EITC free tax preparation program. Um, and we've also begun um, leading some digital equity work in Cuyahoga County. Next slide, please. And so since um, July of 2020, um, CHN has administered almost all of the CARES Act related funding for both Cleveland and our county, Cuyahoga County. Um, the background of this slide is a map of Cuyahoga County. Each of those little orange dots is a household that received rental assistance through our agency. To date, we've provided almost $53 million in rental assistance across the county, and we've served almost 13,000 households. Um, through the, the building of that program, um, we've established really great partnerships and a really great infrastructure that can hopefully lead to other things. Um, we've been able to collect a lot of really great um, data that we've been able to use then as we go out and we advocate for the use of ARPA funding locally in Cleveland, um, especially as it relates to rental assistance and home ownership. So what we've seen, as I'm sure, um, and I'll stay on the, the past slide, please. Um, thank you. Um, and so what, what we saw, as I'm sure you've all seen, is that COVID-19 just exacerbated all of the longstanding and deeply rooted housing instability and equity, um, particularly among Black households. Um, with this emergency pandemic response, it required really deep collaboration between not only us and our funders, but other nonprofits, foundations, and local organizers um, that came together to enact some really reactive um, measures. Um, what we think is that such urgent COVID-19 response has really created capacity and laid the foundation for long-term post-pandemic um, supports and ARPA is just a catalyst for those. Um, so through everything that we built, um, we think that we can take that same system and coordination and create a more sustainable long-term solution um, for housing. Next slide, please. And so the way that we've been building and, and will continue to evolve our program is we think what um, happened as a federal emergency response 
um, we're now in this transition phase where we're building out this really robust ecosystem of federal and local supports, including ARPA. Um, so we think that moving forward to be effective, um, the efforts that we are advocating for locally, um, primarily through ARPA, are citywide, accessible, scaled, collaborative, and equitable um, resources to locally fund um, projects that will create long-term change. Um, so the two areas that we are really focused on are one, developing a locally funded city and county affordable housing fund. Um, ARPA funding is the perfect opportunity for us to create this flexible funding pool where we're not reliant on dollars coming from home or CDBG, where we're a little bit more restricted. Um, as mentioned earlier by, by Rob, this is a more flexible fund. And so we want to um, be creative and, and innovative and use that flexibility to our benefit. And then with home ownership, we also want to look at bridging together four um, initial impact areas that we think together will enact big change locally. Um, so looking at funding first mortgages, down payment assistance, acquisition rehab and infill, as well as um, home repair. Um, we would create a central entry point, um, much like we did with emergency rental assistance, um, so that individuals have really easy access to this, not just clients, but our partners as well. Next slide, please. So looking at those in a, a bit more detail, um, with mortgages, we um, recently were certified as a CDFI um, and our housing counseling um, shop will be providing all of the first time home buyer education for our first mortgage product. Um, but we are looking at providing mortgages in areas that have typically not had a lot of investment. Um, so ac access to mortgages for people of color, low income households, and people with imperfect credit are those that we're hoping to reach with this first mortgage product. Um, so the solution through ARPA, we're looking at first mortgage funds, so a revolving loan pool, as well as a loan loss reserve um, to help protect us a little bit as we move forward with this. With down payment assistance, we're looking at expanded scope and eligibility for down payment assistance. Locally, we really rely on things like home and CDBG, which bring a little bit of restriction. And so through ARPA, we're hoping that we could have more flexible income and purchase requirements. For acquisition, rehab, and home repair, um, we're really looking to fill a gap here. So right now in, in Cleveland, as I'm sure you see across the country, there's a real gap um, in the cost of rehab versus the achievable purchase price for a home. So looking at access to flexible, low cost working capital and grant capital for subsidies for construction costs and appraisal gaps, which we think will be hugely helpful, um, especially in um, the city of Cleveland and our first ring suburbs. And then finally, home repair. Um, so access to capital for LMI homeowners and landlords. Um, I think throughout the past year, we've seen landlords being especially hit. Their tenants weren't able to pay rent and we were able to quickly um, provide rental assistance for those tenants, but it still left the landlords um, in, in a little bit of a, a disadvantage. So we would like to also assist them. Um, and so providing a flexible and fully resourced home repair program through grants and loans um, we see as being especially helpful. In each of these areas that I, I mentioned, what we've been able to do throughout the crisis and with our rental assistance program is incorporate housing counseling into everything we do. Um, we know that many of these clients and households are coming to us um, if not in acute need, they have experienced some sort of hardship over the past two years. And so our housing counseling staff, I, I think in these past two years have all um, been wearing multiple hats. I think our housing counselors have become social workers to a, a certain degree. Um, and they, they really need resources that they can access quickly so that when we're asking the questions from our counseling clients of what they need, 
we're then able to come with a solution and an answer. Um, and we think that a lot of these home ownership and rental assistance programs that we're able to offer through things like ARPA, um, Emergency Rental Assistance, and the Homeowner Assistance Fund really just complement um, what we've gotten really great at doing through our health and counseling programs. Next slide, please. And that's it. Um, so I have um, my contact information on the screen. Um, please, please feel free to reach out to me directly if you have any questions or if you are just getting started with any of these programs. We've got um, you know, plenty of skinned knees um, and successes that, that I'd be happy to share. Um, and thank you again to um, Bruce and the team for having me. Um, Kate, that was just excellent. Let me just ask you on the DPA program, you mentioned more flexible income and purchase requirements. So what are those? Yeah, so we've seen in certain areas of our, our city, you know, we on the near west side of Cleveland, we've seen a lot of growth and the cost of housing has just increased dramatically and it's made it harder for our 80% AMI um, buyers to get into some of our markets. And so we'd really like to see um, folks have more flexibility. Um, and we'd also like to see some um, down payment assistance plugged in where right now our, our first time home buyer programs come with, um, depending on where you're getting it, different um, qualifications. And we'd like to make it as easy as possible for a homeowner who is ready to purchase a home to be able to purchase a home. So we're really just trying to cut out barriers and, and make it as easy as possible while still providing housing counseling and making sure that we are putting um, folks into a home that will be successful um, as a homeowner. Yeah, so one of the, th uh, the principles we sort of we did a lot of work on down payment assistance, some of it more successful than others. Um, and, uh, and one of the principles is that you shouldn't use down payment to do underwriting, down payment assistance to do underwriting. Let the lender, um, whoever it's providing, the, the loan do the underwriting. And this is just an add on. Rob, did you want to jump in on this as well? Yeah, I just wanted to, and I will include this, I'll, I'll copy and paste the language from the Federal Register um, <clears throat> section directly into the chat, uh, but there is explicit language in the final rule from Treasury around the fact that these state and local fiscal recovery fund dollars can explicitly, explicitly be used for down payment assistance, not just for upfront down payment, but also for uh, if uh, wanted to create reserve programs. So, um, so I will include that language in there as well. Excellent. Very, very good. Um, we're going to transition quickly to um, uh, Anne Arundel County. Um, they weren't able to join us today, um, and um, they're in a much different place. Um, they're in a situation where they're, they're well, actually, I should first say it's Anne Arundel Affordable Housing Coalition, and they are, um, um, so they haven't actually done anything, but they ended up getting um, uh the county called them up and said, what, um, what should we do? And how would it be best to use the money? And, um, you know, and this is just it, it is a perfect example of this where um, uh, these are kind of coming in with some blank slates. And this is why it's a big opportunity for our work. Um, and uh, let me just walk through the bullet points they sent us. I um, hope I do justice to it. Um, so they're um, a volunteer member organization of housing professionals um, who come together around affordable housing issues in their county. Um, uh, and, they, and their county has, um, in Maryland has $112 million in ARPA money. So serious money here. The county executive asked for stakeholder input on how to spend it. Um, and so they advocated for a variety of purposes, including new development, rehabilitation of existing affordable housing. And, and you know, that's actually a really big issue that sometimes it costs more to fix up a property than the sale price is available. Um, and, or um, you can fix it up, but um, it, it puts the cost so high that it's not affordable to low and moderate income people. So um, we're having subsidies for rehab 
really important for preserving housing stock. Um, for the acquisition and conversion of non-housing buildings, um, so um, those there's lots of opportunities there. And then market rate housing properties to affordable income restricted housing, so that um, we have sort of longer term affordability. So all these are important ideas. They parallel very much what Kate was talking about. Um, and the county executive dedicated uh, $10 million in ARPA funds for the housing trust fund managed by the county and that can be used for affordable housing. Um, uh, so they haven't actually made a decision about how the rest of the money would be spent, um, but this is, this, it's an ongoing process and, and this is a group that is getting to engage in it. Um, and uh, I mean, and that, that's quickly the summary of it. Um, but uh, the idea is that if you're if your localities um, and this could be city, county, or state um, haven't decided how to use all of their money yet, um, it's really a conversation worth having. Um, and I think on two levels, one might be a, a project that you might your agency might do on its own if you have the capacity, but on another one, which might be how can what you can do jointly with other groups in a way that. Um, uh, leverages everybody's strengths and allows you to do the good work you do, but others can contribute in their own way, whether it's in um, construction lending um, or uh, uh, rehab or whatever. So uh, we uh, I thought this would be an important um, conversation to uh, help uh, continue our work. Um, let me, uh, let's flip over right now to um, Ebony to see um, if we've got some questions in the queue. We do have uh, a few questions. Um, and I do want to remind everyone, if you do have a question for any of our panelists today, please add them to the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. Uh, the first question that we have today is, do organizations then apply directly or through their municipality? So I'll, I'll answer that, but I, I suspect Kate uh, probably has direct experience with what their process has been. Generally speaking, um, the, the programs need to be designed before you can apply for anything. So uh, in order for uh, housing counseling itself to be funded and for any of the interventions that housing counselors can deploy that we've been talking about can be funded, your city, your county, or your state, or all of all three of them have to design programs that spend the money that way. So it's really more about first uh, engaging and advocating that the programs funded by ARPA state and local fiscal, refund, uh, fiscal recovery funds include those uses before you could then go about uh, trying to apply. Uh, but Kate, since you've actually been on the front lines, you probably have a better perspective on that than I do. Sure, thanks Rob. Um, and, and that's it. Um, what we did was in, in December, um, CHN and another um, local group called Cleveland Neighborhood Progress put together recommendations that they then submitted to our city and county council, um, since they would be the folks to ultimately um, vote on, on what we can or cannot do with these funds. Um, and what we've seen coming through our county and our city is they've been, over the past few weeks, they've been sending out a lot of RFQs and asking for us to respond. And what's interesting is when we are on vendor calls now, compared to the in the past, when the county said, here's the program, here's what we're going to do. Now the county has flipped that a bit and they've said, we want to know how you can support home ownership and housing and social service supports in, in Cuyahoga County, respond to this RFQ, um, and then we'll use that to guide how we build programs. So it's been um, a really great thing to say where because of the flexibility of these funds, it seems like our local government is being less prescriptive and they're really looking for folks to have boots on the ground to help them. Um, put together these programs. Um, so we're really looking forward to seeing how that evolves over the coming year. 
Thank you so much. I do, uh, now I have a question, several questions in regards to SLFRP. The first question is, do you think city governments will lump these funds within their fiscal year budgets? So the short answer is it depends on what size of a uh, city and what size of an allocation. Um, the, the, the smaller awarded uh, or recipients who receive smaller amounts, I believe the threshold is $10 million under the final rule, have a little bit more of uh, what I think could be uh, equated to like a standard deduction where uh, the scrutiny that Treasury is going to give on an award of $10 million or lower to one of those smaller uh, population municipalities is, uh, is going to be different and a bit more flexible than on uh, recipients who have uh, larger amounts, which would generally be larger population counties and, and cities. So, um, so for, the very, for the very small awards, um, it is possible that city governments will consume all of their uh, all of their allocations for the state and local fiscal recovery funds to replace lost revenue typically. Um, and so um, so the extent to which that sort of uh, lumping it in with their with their fiscal budgets, some of them may do it. Some of them may feel like they have no choice but to do it given the fiscal constraints that they're under. But generally speaking, those with larger awards uh, that don't have those, demonstrable lost revenues because treasury has to, has formulas that cities have to uh, cities and counties and states have to demonstrate in order for them to use those uh, dollar amounts for lost revenues um there will be uh I, i'm i'm what i'm seeing is new programs created or existing programs being funded um at uh with uh, larger um support given that there is now this federal um resource to use towards them Thank you. And the next question is, do you re recommend advocating to the local governments for investments in housing counseling in general and highlight the fact that they are receiving SLFRP? I would urge advocating at all layers of government, as daunting as it can be to try and sort of address not just your city, but your county leadership and your state leadership. Um, it really is, uh, I, I, the results are already sort of varying wildly. Some places are working more, uh, more collaboratively than others. Um, it sounds like Cuyahoga County and the city of Cleveland are playing pretty well together, um, but uh, there are a lot of communities where the county is going to do what the county is going to do. The, the cities within that county are going to do their own thing too. Um, and again, there's also these large amounts coming to every state. So really engaging at all levels for investments in housing counseling. There's also um, many of these processes are already underway, um, but some places have not um, uh, finalized uh, their awards or I, I know some places are sort of programming X amount of their total allocation and then waiting to see what next year's sort of budget looks like and shortfalls look like because they don't want to over program and then have holes that they would have wanted to fill with some of these funds. Uh, but I know some cities have done really deep engagement at, uh, uh, you know, across their population, sending out surveys, holding community meetings, asking for community members to designate what their priorities would be for how these funds get spent, and then doing all the things that Kate talked about with respect to the RFQs and really asking local partners doing the work on the ground to give feedback on uh, what value they can um, they can bring if they they have programs uh, and services that they provide that are eligible for these uh, for these funds. Thank you, Rob. I do want to remind everyone that if you have a question, please add, uh, add it to the Q and A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, also, one more question: uh, How should or does this funding? change our advocacy for funding support on the local level. Was Christy turning her camera back on because she wanted to uh, jump in on that front? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Sorry. She, she said no. <laughs> okay, gotcha. 
Um, it, it is potentially more resources at your disposal. Um, they need the programs need to really be addressing populations that uh, were impacted or disproportionately impacted in many communities. That uh, that chart looks like a big circle um, because uh, so many communities have been impacted and populations have been impacted. So, um, so I I I would leave it to Kate and Bruce and others to talk about what changes you think from the housing counseling community perspective should be brought to the advocacy strategies for folks working at the at their local levels. I think um, for us, we've just been really looking at the opportunities we have as a, a housing counseling group to be flexible and think more creatively when we're not just looking at how things will fit within our HUD um, housing counseling program. We're, we're very used to doing certain things in a certain way, um, but with this funding, we're able to really advocate for what we want to do um, and may have been putting off because of HUD or we didn't have the capacity to do it. Um, I think my only, um, I guess word of warning uh, around funding as it relates to housing counseling is just knowing what your capacity is because with this new new types of funding comes additional reporting um, and system requirements that you just need to be um, able to, to handle. So I think that's also an opportunity where you can use this funding to build your capacity and infrastructure to better um, assist your housing counseling programs. So we really, um, within the past couple of years, we're able to invest in things like our customer um, relation database. We moved into Salesforce and expanded that. Um, and, and so I think those are things that you can advocate for through this funding as well to really support um, your current business that will then you know, stick around um, into the future. So this investment can really be a catalyst for, for a lot. That's great. Let me ask one more question, and I think we're going to close it out then. Um, and that is, um, so in Rob's presentation, you talked about low and moderate income as being below 65% um, AMI. And, and Kate, you were really talking about some programs that went to 80% AMI or less. Um, so can some of the funds be used above 65%? And, and do you want to ex just explain why and when, Rob, if you've got that yet. Yeah. I'll give a quick general, but Kate, you, uh, I'll, I'll flip it to you to talk exactly how you're working it. The way, the way folks that we've been talking to have been sort of understanding and operationalizing the rule is <clears throat> those thresholds automatically create a presumption that at 40 AMI or below, that population is quote unquote disproportionately impacted. Uh, whereas the moderate income, 65% uh, uh, AMI or below, creates a presumption that the uh, that that population itself is impacted, uh, just based on uh, data and trends that Treasury has seen about how low and moderate income communities are are uh, facing all kinds of negative economic externalities from the from the crisis. So the it creates presumptions that are there, but that doesn't mean that. Um, that only um, the populations at or below each of those thresholds can be deemed impacted or disproportionately impacted. There's a whole uh, other set of factors um, that just communities that are receiving the funds and deploying them to serve populations just need to be prepared to demonstrate to Treasury that um, this community, uh, 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 this community was impacted by the uh, pandemic in the following ways or disproportionately impacted by the pandemic in the following ways, which unlocks being able to address things and serve populations that don't just fall underneath those. But if you are a, a program that solely serves low income uh, households, for example, you, that compliance reporting is almost, um, you know, uh, as easy as it can be because uh, uh, Treasury's created those sort of presumptions there. Just, I think that the real reason they've created those presumptions is to make, uh, to encourage communities to develop programs that serve those populations so that they don't have to 
have uh, hesitation around what is the compliance around it going to be. Uh, so, so I think it's just designed to really push funds in those directions and say, if you do serve these populations, your compliance reporting is going to be a heck of a lot easier. Great. Well, I mean, that that's it. Do any, Kate, do you want to have a closing remark? I was just going to say that's exactly it. <laughs> that's how, how we're moving forward. <laughs> Sounds great. Well, terrific work, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to just do a quick reminder now about um, uh, joining NHRC. Um, you know, this is going to be continuing our work uh, in 2022, uh, pushing for um, increased and um, more available housing counseling funding. Um, we'll, we'll continue working on advocating on affordable housing issues, on down payment assistance, disaster recovery. We're really, we, we think there's some opportunity this year to maybe solve some of the disaster recovery issues still uh, and, and getting bipartisan support there. We'll, we'll be doing a lot, um, we're doing a, hopefully a lot that will help make it easier for your local communities to recruit black and brown participants and, and get them into housing solutions. Um, and of course, you still get some of the discounts um, uh, that, that, are, that are part of our work. So, so please, um, um, you can always go to our website. Um, there's a membership form uh, to use. Uh, we've now upgraded our services so that you could do a, a direct um, um, electronic deposit to pay the membership dues, as well as taking checks. I haven't quite mastered the credit card thing yet. Our, our um, actual host fiscal sponsor, um, it's a little more complicated uh, uh, piece to us that we haven't quite figured out, but we're still working on it. But, um, you know, we'll, we can do electronic deposit or we can do um, take checks. So with that quick note, thanks everybody. I think this is a valuable presentation. Again, it'll be posted on our website so that we can, um, uh, so that you've got others who'd like to hear it. I think it was pretty high content. Um, this will be a useful one for everybody. We'll keep an eye out on the leaders list for um, the next times around and look out for emails from, from Christy about um, our advocacy in Congress. Uh, there'll be a lot we'll be doing in the next month. Thanks everybody and keep up the good work. Bye.